All right, welcome back everybody. Um, thanks for hanging in there. I can see from the attendee list, we, we lost only a couple people, which I think is great because these these the last session of the day, transportation GIS and surveying is, is gonna be a good one. Uh, and we know with the uh, possible infrastructure bill or infrastructure act coming up that this will be a lot of opportunities for both uh, GIS and practitioners and surveyors. The uh, and we, we know the transportation industry uses a lot of GIS for a long time for route planning and managing data and communicating internally and communicating externally with stakeholders. Uh, GI help, GIS helps surveyors throughout the entire infrastructure life cycle from planning to construction to operations. We've got two great speakers to help us uh, understand what's going on out there. Uh, Richard Kleinman. Uh, is our first speaker. He's the geospatial transportation lead at Ayers Associates in, in, uh, in Waukesha, Waukesha, Wisconsin. And he's currently focused on the transportation program and bringing in photogrammetry surveying and GIS professionals together. And I really like this in a 3 O spatial mindset. I, I wish I had thought about that. I like that. Uh, he's active in the geospatial community, serving as a co-chair of the Wisconsin uh, Geospatial uh, Spatial Reference System 2022 Task Force, and sever several other notable areas, including uh, the Transportation Research Board Geospatial uh, Data Technologies Committee, which sounds quite interesting. Uh, he's going to talk about GIS surveying a successful mo uh, mobile pavement condition data collection, see how both GIS and surveying come together to ensure mobile pavement condition data collection projects are successful. Both are critical to project success, and Richard's going to explain to us why and how. And our second speaker in this session is Linda Foster. And I think you've heard a bit about uh, from her earlier. Uh, she's a senior project manager of geospatial tech at Ferber Engineering. Uh, she's a PLS, a GISP, an FAA Part 107 certificate holder. You're going to have to explain that, Linda. I think that's a drone pilot. The uh, She's a mentor in the ERISA Mentoring Network and is a NSPS board member uh, leading and leading South Dakota's low distortion projection uh, for incorporating into NGS's uh, NSRS modernization. Now, piece of trivia, her master's degree is in the parcel fabric. So when we have questions from uh, the previous two presentations, you're welcome to ask them to Linda as well. Her, her presentation is on improving highway safety with geospatial technology. Uh, she'll discuss Pennington County signing and delineation project and how they developed an approach to maximize safety, efficiency, and objectivity. It used GPS, mobile image, imaging, digital ball banking, and GIS to survey existing countywide signage, uh, evaluate all horizontal curves, and produce design plans for the project. And I had to actually look up one or two words um, from her abstract, so I hope she can help explain all those to Probably everyone on the phone understands, but the, I had a couple of those up. But uh, let's kick this off, Richard. All right, let me uh, share my screen here. Let's see. All right, there, can you see my screen? Uh, yep. Great, thanks, Brent. That's great. Um, yeah, I was skeptical about the virtual format, but I am so stoked by the, the conversation happening here and the interaction between everybody. It's uh, really good to hear. Um, uh, Dr. Van Sickle's uh, presentation, you know, pointed out in some cases the stakes are, are very high in this new digital twin autonomous vehicle world we're, you know, entering. And I ought to say the fourth dimension time is going to bite you, right? So let's uh, let's get going on this. Yep, I gotta get to the right screen here. There we go. And I go through an agenda here, my background, why I think we're here today, that uh, trio spatial uh, um, thing I coined up there. And, and Brent, I gotta learn to come up with shorter um, titles. I can't even say this, mobile pavement condition collection and analysis as example. <laughs> um, next time that'll be shorter. And I got a little time, I'll throw in a, a bonus uh, example on a transportation project right away, GIS uh, project uh, a buddy of mine came up with. 
So I hate doing these here, except for it does give people background, like, well, who's this guy? What's he talking about? Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, you went over some of my background, uh, but uh, I'll sum it up by saying, yeah, I'm a longtime surveyor, licensed in Wisconsin, 1985, um, spent 32 years in the um, public sector, municipal and state levels, and then back to the private sector when I joined the aerial mapping group and uh, airs in 19 or 2017. So yeah, um, it's it's really about uh, bringing people together um, here, and, and that's my background, both in surveying and GIS. Kind of spun up a, a citywide GIS utility uh, at West Bend, the city I work for, and just like to bring GIS into the solution. So why are we here today, right? You know, um, building bridges. Um, between survey, GIS, and aerial mapping. And I took the liberty to add aerial mapping to that mix um, because that's uh, my position. That's where I am every day. At AERS, our geospatial division is made up of the aerial mapping group that I'm in and the survey group. And we, we both work closely together and both of us use GIS uh, every day to, to make things happen. And I'll echo Preston's uh, take on surveyors and GIS needing to work together. When I was at the city of West Bend, there was a well-worn path between my office and the, and the GIS folks uh, when they were doing their parcel mapping. And, you know, I'd help them, you know, interpret a difficult deed or whatever. And every time I did an engineering project where we spotted lot corners, I fed that back into the GIS to improve the, the mapping. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, Today and just echoing what a lot of the speakers said, um, that you know, bringing bringing us all together. The next thing is is not only building bridges, but I think we're here to show that uh, we increase the value of the solutions we provide when we work together when we build those bridges. Um, it you know here's a case in in you know on the left. This was a bridge uh, before. Um, we redid it. A lot of people use that bridge for fishing and stuff, couldn't really get at it. So our engineers came up with a value added solution. Let's make it a public park, easily accessible, right? Same thing we do with uh, surveying and GIS. When we get together, um, there's more value added. So I came up with this, uh, you know, thinking about this, you know, coin this uh, term, and uh, got our marketing people to find me some nifty little uh, graphics to make it work. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I like to think of geospatial as trio spatial, surveying, GIS, and aerial mapping together. You know, you remove any one of those and, and oh, there's my next quote, reduces the value of the data, I believe, and it diminishes the overall potential for success. I gotta move one of these windows around here. Here we go. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's just all about working together. And and some of this is caused by exterior forces coming together. Um, when I was throwing this slide together, it's like, wow, that's all getting kind of blurry. And yeah, that's that's the reality. Um, the lines are getting blurry. And I think um, G or uh, lidar is a big reason for that. Um, when LIDAR came into uh, daily use at our firm in a lot of places, I think they're like, well, who has the, the computing power processing, you know, to be able to handle these huge data sets? And it lands in aerial mapping because we've been doing aerial LIDAR and, and large data sets for quite some time. So what happens is, is there's such a blurring between um, aerial mapping and surveying that uh, they're doing now terrestrial scanning, static scanning. Um, we do mobile LIDAR scanning, and now we're doing um, aerial UAS scanning of LIDAR. So that just brings us all together, you know, all in, you know, and you can't avoid it. So we're pretty much, uh, you know, in this together is the message, right? 
And along those lines, and I think somebody brought that up in the, the chat boxes before, I always encourage uh, cross-certification. You know, if a PLS can get their um, GISP or um, the aerial mapping people, you know, we've got certified photogrammetrists, we've got certified mapping scientists and in LIDAR, and there's a certified mapping scientist in GIS um, that we have. So everybody can, you know, improve themselves and, and work together. And what that does is um, adds value to your own resume. If there's a surveyor out there or a GIS person thinking, you know, what happens when the economy dies and, you know, am I gonna uh, hold on to my job? I know of surveyors that held on to their job because they knew GIS. They're more valuable to the firm um, in knowing both or having a foot in both worlds. Like Linda will totally attest to that. Um, and, and that diverse experience, you know, raises your value to the firm, you know, during those slow times, but it also um, widens the types of projects that your, your firm can, can tackle. <clears throat> and same thing on a firm level type thing, you know, if you don't have a specific division or discipline in-house, you know, don't be afraid to form a team. You know, if you don't have aerial mapping or, or GIS folks in your team, uh, in your firm, and you're looking for a, a project to do, you know, get together, form a team. We do that all the time. So finally, after uh, just echoing what uh, everybody else has said during the whole conference so far, um, but I just thought it was well worth going over. Um, here's my first uh, example um, with a little shorter title, a mobile pavement condition analysis example. Um, this one shows how surveying and GIS come together to add value to that vast amount of data collected during these pavement analysis jobs. Um, and in actuality, it uh, involves survey GIS, our aerial map beam folks, and we can't forget in this case, a pavement engineer um, who's doing the pavement analysis. So it takes a, it takes a village, right, is, is the same. To start out on these projects, basically it starts with data collection. Um, in this case, what we're looking at here is uh, one of our trusted uh, collection partners, ESP, their, their brand new uh, pavement condition uh, um, van with all kinds of sensors on there, um, collects at highway speeds, it has LIDAR and imagery, and that pavement sensors, they're like you know, one millimeter resolution over a four meter wide um, lane with, and then you add that, the, the LIDAR I mentioned, you know, million points per second, dual scanners, you know, situated so there's not shadows on that. So that's a full, full-blown uh, um, solution. And we can implement all those sensors or, or parts of them, depending on the, the project needs. There's a little shot of the, the longitudinal profile and roughness uh, sensor hanging on the front of that van, um, collects the, the road profile cross-section, and calculates the road roughness and profile measurements. And actually not just the lane, but the, each wheel track is kind of tracked for rutting and, and ride, um, ride condition, I guess you'd call it. In addition to those sensors, we're, we're firing all kinds of digital cameras. Um, this is uh, at a minimum, two Ladybug 5 spherical 360 degree cameras. Basically think of those as a street view or still cameras around the edges and one pointing up um, that uh, captures, captures underneath the bridges, um, sign structures over the roadways and all kinds of things up there. And at a minimum, that's that one. Oftentimes we'll hang on a couple more digital uh, cameras with even higher resolution that capture um, signs and all kinds of information around the, the edges of the roads. Then in addition to you know, the pavement condition, the, like the sensor on the front um, is a lot of that and the cameras are a lot of that. Um, but there's different ways, like sometimes LIDAR is good for rutting and other, um, other sensors are good for cracking and all kinds of stuff like that. But what 
we're looking at in this case is a dual survey grade LIDAR sensors. Um, by adding that uh, LIDAR, you can collect GIS assets, signs, poles, you know, all kinds of things correctly, but with the proper sensors, you can actually collect survey level um, data. And I know we talked about, you know, and I agree, that term survey grade and mapping grade, that's gonna go away. Um, we're gonna be talking numbers as things more and more converge, right? Um, but in addition to that uh, um, LIDAR sensor, you got a couple other sensors out there. Um, the Planix uh, 520 plus IMU, so that's a initial or inertial measurement unit. So when you go underneath the bridges um, or you're in building shadows and stuff like that, that senses roll, pitch, and yaw. Um, same kind of uh, devices are in our aircraft um, that way. In addition to that, you got uh, GPS antennas, dual GPS antennas, survey grade. And then you have a DMI, distance measuring instrument uh, on the wheel. That's that circular uh, item there on the, on the left um, that is measuring distance as you go. You combine them all together and you got a really robust uh, data collection um, system. So now let's get into the, the data side. Um, you know, in these things, the data side is extensive in these pavement analysis jobs. It's just crazy amount of data. But um, data without purpose is, you know, just that data, right? You want to tailor your data to your client's needs. Um, when I design a, a GIS, I like to start by defining the questions your client wants to ask of the data then design that data that it's able to answer those questions. Um, on the left, you see a, a long list of uh, data that uh, we can collect over this system, and that's not all of it. I mean, um, cracks, raveling, shelving, I don't even know what some of those things mean, but right, that's why we have pavement engineers. Um, but a lot of data, and, and then we'll get into later how GIS, uh, expresses that. Again, part of the data is you're going to be collecting the routes you traveled, seg segments of those routes. Basically, um, that might be broken down block by block or by pavement type or by pavement or uh, road cross-section. Is it urban, um, divided, undivided, stuff like that. And then into, into that, the next thing is the actual pavement fault features. You know, this is the meat of the data. This is why you're out there. You know, this is collecting where, how much, and how bad are the faults. Um, basically, so for cracks, for instance, is the screen, it's really, you can't read it, but they're showing is that a longitudinal crack, a transverse crack, alligator cracking, and then they have the severity of, you know, medium, high, or, or low, you know, rankings on all that. And then here's where we come in with expressing, right? When I said um, data for data's sake is, is, is not what you're after, right? You, if you got all this data and you can't convey it um, to your, the decision makers, um, you haven't done your job. Um, and here's where um, GIS folks come into so much uh, value into this is where they know how to cartographically display and tell stories with maps, right? Um, and the whole point behind these pavement condition surveys are you get a, an index, um, a pavement condition index, a PCI rating, or there's another version, a PASER rating, um, that answers you know, where, how much, and how bad are things. Um, by looking at that map, you can see, wow, there's a bad uh, subdivision down there in the you know, south end of the, the um, city or whatever this is, right? You know, zoom in there and figure out what's going on. Um, basically, this helps the DOTs, municipalities, and agencies best spend their limited budget resources, right? Um, I've been in places where it's, uh, well, if this alderman in his district yells the loudest, he gets the most uh, um, project dollars. You know, it shouldn't be that way, right? You should use your engineering um, decision making and, and data to back up where to spend the money and, and how. Again, still uh, focusing on the data. Um, 
part of the data that comes out of this uh, collection is all the vector data, all the, all the cracking can be exported in a um, CAD or GIS. Uh, a lot of times uh, put them out in the ESRI Geo database um, and even a, um, a Google KMZ, depending on what they want. A lot of them, it's just a, a nice export. Um, but this is where, um, keep this image on the right in mind, when we start talking about um, um, start talking about accuracy and seeing how things uh, line up with your data, right? You can't collect all this data and have them cracks um, not be in the you know, right, right spot. Images. So here we got a bunch of images. The uh, images actually sometimes amount to be more, more data than the, the LIDAR. Um, and here, the last part on the data is uh, that hanging that LIDAR on there allows you to actually collect design survey information, use create uh, mapping for design projects, basically. Um, you get all the planometrics and even the DTM and surface, if you have all the right uh, um, sensors out there. Looking at my time here, getting a little short. Uh, data dictionary. Um, this is where you design it, right, from the start. So you, uh, you set up your databases so that they can answer those questions um, that they want to know. Reporting, there's a tabular reporting. Um, these can be configured to whatever you need. There's industry standards on those PCI and HAZER ratings that uh, you can output and combine this with the mapping is, is how you're going to tell your, your story, right? Then and then control survey makes it accurate, right? Um, this is where it adds value um, to that original um, data. Um, basically, this control survey provides a base level of accuracy that allows crack mapping to accurately line up with the data. If you don't have a good IMU and your data starts drifting over time as you're going and doesn't line up with their, you know, the base project data, that's that's a problem. So if you you got to have a, a base level of control, like you see there on the right, um, to make it uh, make it all good. That combined with the high accuracy sensors, um, you just got to remember that um, this level of accuracy provides a consistent level, whether you've lost GPS or not throughout the project. So. Like I say, consistent uh, positional data adds value. You know, start with the solid uh, control with the survey grade sensors. That allows you to move up from asset level to design level data, um, and allows you to data mine additional features out of out of the the work you've done. And that happens by densifying and maybe even leveling instead of GPS elevations on the survey control using PIDs, photo identifiable objects like corners of stop bars and corners of sidewalks that you didn't pre-paint and stuff like that. By using that densified additional control, you can calibrate portions of your area of interest um, to do high level, say just in one area, they need to do a guardrail um, rehab or something. You could add stuff to it or add control. And what's that do? adds value. So that all said, you know, all that uh, accuracy and, uh, um, and data maybe isn't what you need. Here's a, a case where we just worked on a job for a um, client where we basically hung a couple of Garmin Verb cameras on the truck, drove the, the haul routes and had our pavement engineers do a sampling of it. And so we basically had, um, twin camera spatially integrated video that we could grab stills from if we needed. And then the engineers did a pavement condition, you know, um, rating on it, basically um, documenting conditions of haul roads before construction um, to see if they were damaged. So we'll keep on moving, uh, kind of quick here. Bonus example, a uh, zoo interchange uh, in Wisconsin. When I worked for WisDOT, uh, I think we were working on this is one of the largest uh, interchanges in the state, one of the busiest ones there. And, and we were acquiring right away for that interchange at the time. And one of my friend surveyors came up with this uh, idea is that this is what your typical 
complicated right away plat looks like even confuses a surveyor uh, at times, you know. Um, but this surveyor was GIS uh, savvy. He developed a GIS solution, you know, that a wide variety of, uh, um, to help with a wide variety of uses, including that uh, um, right away data. A lot of people use it. So they started out in the um, survey world and microstation inroads with closed alignments, closed polygons. That's what they use to draft the legals and compute uh, areas with. And they exported to an Esri geodatabase and added information uh, fields to it. And then as a bonus, uh, to reach even more people, he exported that to a KMZ so more people could get at it. Updated daily. And because that was such an easy product to get to managers, appraisers, utility, coordinators, real estate personnel, and surveyors all use this uh, data every day. Um, just by simply clicking on a, a, a polygon, you got, uh, did it, was it staked? Was it acquired? You know, who's the owner? You know, that kind of information um, that everybody had daily access to. So all because a surveyor knew GIS saw a need and added value. So there we go. I'll wrap up. Uh, if there's some time for questions, I'll gladly answer them or uh, you guys got my um, contact information there. Scrambling for the mute button for the last 20 months here. Hey, good job, uh, Richard. That's a great presentation. There's a lot of, there's some technical questions in the chat box you might want to take a look at. Uh, Ryan's been, been answering them, uh, you know, vectorize the cracks and you know, how large are the data sets, things like that. So you might want to pay attention to a couple of those in the chat box. Um, but all right, I like we'll the, do. I, yeah, I like bringing all that data together in, in one kind of, uh, you know, in one, you know, one view in Overland. It. The, uh, I've done some similar work in pipeline doing the same thing. So it's interesting to see it done with pavement. But, but thanks for that nice presentation. Now we're going to move on. Yeah, we're going to continue the, transportation surveying track. And we're gonna go with our own Linda Foster here. And if you can take control, let's see. Okay, so Richard, can you stop sharing? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And while while we're transitioning, I wanna thank everyone for hanging in there because this, that was a pretty good, that was a, Quite a valuable presentation, as will as will the last one. There we go. Very good. Okay, Linda, are you ready? I am ready to go. All right. You let me know when you can see my screen. I uh, got. Yeah, looks great. Looks good. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone for for sticking around here uh, for the last presentation. I looked at the the schedule and thought, you know, we got to got to make it interesting and, and worth your time here to, to stick it out to the end of the day. It's, it's been a great day, great conversations. Uh, so I thought I would take you on a little bit of a virtual field trip here. So I hope you'll ride along with me and, and enjoy this as we go along. You're looking at some drone footage here of the Black Hills of South Dakota. That's where I'm located and uh, where the project that we'll be talking about here today, the Pennington County Siding and Delineation Project, uh, where uh, part of it happened as well. So I know we have folks that on the call here from all over uh, the United States. So this just gives you a, a glance at where uh, this project is located and where I'm from here, the Rapid City, South Dakota area. We're the second largest city in the state of South Dakota on the western side of the state. And I always, like Richard, hate to spend much time on this, but I thought I would just touch briefly uh, as I do have a bit of a unique background I have a bachelor's degree in geological engineering and a master's degree in GIS. I am a registered land surveyor and also a certified GIS professional. And I do hold my FAA uh, SUAS remote pilot's license uh, to fly drones. A little bit about my experience. I've been in private consulting for over 17 years and I did spend about one year in the public sector. Um, Professional involvement, as Brett mentioned earlier in, in my bio, I'm an NSPS director representing the state of South Dakota. I am the past president of the South Dakota Society of Professional Land Surveyors. 
I'm also leading the LDP zone development for the state of South Dakota. I serve as a mentor for URISA, and I'm also a board member for the Black Hills Digital Mapping Association, which is a local group here in South Dakota. So as you can see, I, I straddle the line um, quite generously. I have had people ask me, well, what do you identify with? I, or do you call it, consider yourself a land surveyor or a GIS professional? Or I, I say both. I, I work on both sides of it and thoroughly enjoy it. And I'm fortunate in, in the position that I'm in to have a lot of opportunities to do boundary work, to do um, engineering support work, both on the, the surveying side and the GIS side. Uh, you even get to do some underground surveying from here from time to time, as you can see um, on the left side of the slide, some aerial work on the right. And just a brief introduction of the company I'm with. I'm with Ferber Engineering Company. We were founded in Rapid City in 1991, so we're celebrating 30 years this year. Pretty exciting milestone for us. Our areas of practice are very traditional civil engineering, uh, transportation design, water resources, municipal utility design, we do a lot of planning and permitting work, and of course GIS and land surveying support all of these activities. We also have a robust construction administration group inside of our company. So you can see we're a multifaceted, full service civil engineering consulting firm, and I think you'll see how that plays into this project uh, here in a little bit. Our client base is very diverse. Um, we laugh and say we're kind of the Swiss Army knife of consulting firms. Uh, our region is very geographically isolated, and so um, just by survival, we, we have to be very diverse uh, in what we do. And so we have a, a great client base. We work for different federal agencies, state and local governments, uh, private sector utility companies, and private corporations as well. So our company recognized the potential of GIS really early in our business. Um, it really started as a support tool for engineering studies more specifically water resources. And it just grew from there into a planning and engineering design, really a project management tool internally. Now fully immersed in the project life cycle in our company and we've grown to a point now that we do offer, specifically offer GIS, geospatial services as a standalone service as well. But really it, its start was rooted in engineering support, which naturally went hand in hand with the surveying that we do in, inside of our company. We have a survey division as well. We're really one and the same. And the desire for GIS was really its ability to consume, organize, analyze, and communicate massive amounts of complex spatial data. And it just makes GIS an invaluable resource. And I kind of like this graphic I'm showing here, and it really paints the picture of, of how we use GIS in our company. It starts out as a planning tool. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see uh, we gather background information, which there's a lot of it out there, as we've heard through the day today, tons and tons of information readily available. We use that for planning. We can sweep it together. We can start visualizing and answering questions and start um, planning a strategy for a project. And then we roll into surveys. So now we've isolated what it is we need to complete this project successfully, what types of specific survey information uh, are a critical path for uh, the support of our design project. And more often than not, the survey data ends up back in the GIS and gets used um, for analysis purposes, whether it's a study or a design. And quite often our projects um, have study and design tendencies to them. I like Richard's trio spatial analogy and I kind of would really echo that myself, except I would probably put engineering as the third leg and GIS and surveying as the other two, because really that's how it operates here, here for us. Moving into construction, which I mentioned, we do construction, administration, and observation. It's a natural um, progression right into construction. We find ourselves doing a lot of as-built surveys, and more and more of our clients are requiring that those deliverables be um, provided in a GIS format, and they're consuming those in their systems and then continuing to use that data for operations and, and maintenance activities. So it's really um, gratifying to see these project life cycles becoming less siloed and more dynamic. I would say where we used to, you know, we would survey, we would design, we'd build it, everything got filed away and we were done. And then we moved, you know, on to the next, the next project or maybe we're back in the same area and all of a sudden we're starting over at zero. Now we don't have to 
because we can take that as-built data and move it on into the future, which makes it very valuable. So what I wanted to do today is just take a few minutes and talk specifically about how some of these concepts I mentioned um, get applied to, say, a specific project. And this is a project that really, I think, highlights how surveying and GIS and engineering all just go hand in hand. And, you know, Richard made the statement that it increases the value of the solutions we provide. I think this is a, just a, a prime example of, of, of that in action. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the project entailed, what were the over, what was the overview and objectives of the project, and then I'll just kind of step through what we did um, as far as steps during the project. Uh, I'll kind of summarize where we ended up, and if we have any time, I'd be happy to to take a couple of questions as well. So as the title indicates, this is the Pennington County of South Dakota signing and delineation project. So we're talking about highway signage, as you might guess. Doesn't sound incredibly exciting, but I hope I can change your mind about that. So zooming in here on South Dakota, I've highlighted in yellow where Pennington County, South Dakota is. I mentioned earlier, obviously, Rapid City being on the west side of the state. Uh, our client was the South Dakota Department of Transportation and the Pennington County Highway Department. And the objectives of this project were to evaluate existing highway signage, uh, and that was for age and condition, and also conformance with current standards. So a Federal Highway Administration uh, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or MUTCD as some of you may know it, uh, and also the SDDOT design criteria, among other things. We were also responsible for evaluating all of the horizontal curves uh, in, included in the project. The ultimate goal, produce a biddable set of construction plans reflecting current two standard highway signage. So identify signs that need to come out, and their replacements and identified signs that were maybe still viable, but were not in the correct location and call for their removal and replacement. So stepping in just a bit closer here, uh, what's the purpose of this project you might be asking? And it's, it's really it all comes down to safety. Uh, consistent highway signage is one of the most cost effective ways to reduce uh, road departure crashes. That's been studied for years and years and it still holds true. And here in South Dakota, we, we get um, Federal Highway Administration funds to improve um, safety on our transportation system. And the state's been very consistent with applying that funding across the state uh, to do these signage update projects. Some considerations for this project. Pennington County is a relatively large county landmass wise. It's very diverse terrain. You can see we have the Black Hills of, of South Dakota here on the, the west side of the county. You know, elevations in the up, up to in the 7,000 feet range, all the way out to the east side of the county, which is just gently rolling prairie and, and farmland, and down to, you know, 2,800 to 3,000 feet. So very diverse terrain in our county. This project was inclusive of both urban and rural conditions. So we were responsible for all the county roads, five townships worth of roads, uh, four towns we did uh, eval signage evaluation in, and 42 road districts. So we had a nice blend of urban, rural, um, you know, and everything in between, really. All told, we evaluated and designed signage for over 1,000 miles of road. So step one in the project was really our asset and condition survey. But before we could get started, we had to understand what they had for signage assets. We had to get a location, so we needed to know where they were. We had to figure out its age, uh, in which case Pennington County uh, does track age using a, a color-coded sticker on the back of the sign face. And so we were able to, to determine ages that way. And then also evaluate the conditions. So, you know, are they shot up full of bullet holes? Maybe they're only two years old, but they're not viable anymore due to damage, uh, et cetera. So we needed to evaluate the condition. So some challenges to this. Well, we talked about needing to cover over a thousand miles of road. So that's no, no small feat in itself. And really safety. How do we keep our field crews safe in the roadway corridor? And I like this picture here because this is a great example of a lot of the roadway corridor we were tasked to work in. Narrow and winding, there's little to no shoulders. 
little, if any, right of way. Honestly, there's a lot of encroachment right up to the roadway. So safety was obviously a consideration. And as you might imagine, data management and integrity uh, is critical for a project like this. We all know um, data in equals data out, you know, garbage in equals garbage out type of a concept. We needed to be very mindful uh, to take care and really do a great job of being uh, good stewards on the front end uh, with our data collection. And really just to make this massive amount of data uh, available throughout the life cycle, life cycle of the project because we knew we had a lot of steps to get through. So what might be a conventional approach to a project like this? Well, we've known of it being done many different ways. Um, when one traditional method is to have field crews really driving in a vehicle using an odometer and essentially just, you know, marking off from known intersections, mileage, if you will, the approximate sign locations on a paper map, or perhaps walking ditches with GPS equipment and actually physically collecting the sign information that way. Everybody on this call, I'm sure, has a million ways they can see the disadvantages here. Safety and efficiency, that's a big one right there, and data management and accessibility. You can imagine if we had rolls and rolls of paper maps with marks on them, how cumbersome that would be, and not to mention um, just how, how really inefficient that, that is. So what was our approach? We turned to mobile imaging for field collection. Uh, we used GIS along with it to track and manage what had been collected. So that's where GIS came in as a really a management tool we were able to keep track of what had already been driven and what was left to be driven. We also kept track of what data has been post-processed and what stage of the, the processing life cycle is it in. Because as you might imagine, um, 360 degree mobile imagery, which is what we're talking about here, uh, creates a tremendous amount of data in a hurry. And so we had to be uh, pretty mindful in, in being good managers again of our data. And so GIS really helped us with that task. And then in the office, we reduced via photogrammetry uh, in the, the 360 degree imagery, all of our sign assets basically. So we did more or less an office survey from the mobile imagery using photogrammetry. And that resulting data was housed and managed in GIS for use uh, during design. So some obvious advantages here, safety. Uh, the vehicle could really be driven more or less at highway speeds without the need for um, stopping frequently or for employees to get out of the vehicle uh, frequently or be physically, uh, you know, on the side of the road or in the ditches. And then there were some accuracy considerations here. The mobile imaging system is equipped with GPS, cap which is capable of connecting to a core station. So post-process, we had some, some really accurate uh, data to work with here. And another obvious advantage is just efficiency. The collection was very fast. Um, you know, you could just get out and drive and I'm sure you have plenty of hard drive space. That was the, the critical point there. And even with office reduction, there was a tremendous amount of time savings in this instance. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, you can see some of the challenges that we encountered with rock faces and narrow roadways. This is a gravel road that we were, we were traveling here. And the resulting 360 degree roadway imagery drastically reduced the need for additional field visits during design. So you can probably imagine having the ability to essentially just hop in here for a designer to, to stop and take a look at, was there really a delineator over there? Or you know, how far does that rock wall really, really stick out? And were there trees right along this edge? Those are all things we wouldn't have been able to collect by a conventional means of, of surveying or gathering data. So really to summarize step one, uh, which was our asset survey, we used mobile imaging paired with in-office post-processing and reduction and uh, ended up with a highly accurate GIS. And so I, I know we've got GIS folks and we've got surveyors on the line. Everybody's probably dying to know what's that accuracy. Um, on average, because we did do QA2C uh, with conventional surveying means just to check what our photogrammetric reduction was yielding, we were within about a tenth of a foot, 15 hundredths to a tenth of a foot was, was, was pretty consistent. Um, the accuracy really hinged on the folks that were doing reduction 
Um, as long as they were very consistent in the, the process used, it was, it was very uh, good data. Plenty accurate for the use at hand. And I know we've talked about that a lot today. Uh, when you're talking about highway signage, we're not talking about um, putting bolts in a foundation for a building. You know, this, so this is reminding us all to keep in perspective what the use of the data is again. And this is just kind of a nice summary map of, okay, now we've collected our asset, we have everything located. Now we've got a good existing condition inventory ready to go. And we leveraged uh, online mapping, web mapping, ArcGIS online to be able to get this information into the different teams' hands that were a part of this project. They were all using the same data. It was centrally located. We didn't have siloed data sets sitting here, there, and everywhere. Uh, it was, everybody was, was singing off of the same music, if you will. So step two here in the process is horizontal curve analysis. Well, you might be asking, well, why do we analyze horizontal curves? What's, what's this accomplished for us here? Well, essentially, we have to analyze horizontal curves so that we can determine advisory speeds uh, on curve signs, essentially, curve warning signs. Where do we place them and what are those advisory speeds? Now, a conventional approach, and if I had to guess, this might be one that Brent had to look up, is, is ball banking. Um, that's an, a means that traffic engineers have used for, for a long time. It used to consist of a mechanical inclinometer on the dash of a vehicle. You drive through the curve as fast as you felt you could navigate it four times, and you'd record the values, essentially. And so you can imagine this is pretty subjective, as it's pretty dependent on each driver's comfort. Uh, has some safety implications because obviously taking four trips through each curve, you know, go through the curve, turn around, go through, turn around, you know, you're stopping and starting and you're turning around their curves is probably not, um, not the best situation. And it's also very time consuming. And then the spatial aspect of the data and managing that data also, you know, comes into play again as a challenge with that conventional approach. So what did we do? Well, our approach was to utilize a digital ball bank indicator that was attached to a GPS unit. So much safer, as again, the vehicle could more or less be driven at highway speeds or a safe speed um, to navigate the curves on the road. And two passes each direction required for, for this instance. And rather than only measuring force, which is what a traditional ball banking um, inclinometer does, this system was also calculating super elevation and curve radius which is needed to evaluate curves per the current MUTCD guidelines. Another advantage, all the data was spatially located once again and housed in our master uh, enterprise GIS database for use during the design process. So we're you know, continuing to add to our soup can, I like to call a do a database kind of my soup can, all these pieces are going into it and preparing us for design. Also, a report for each curve was generated after field collection, and it summarized the data collected and the analysis performed. And this, to me, was critical because this increased the objectivity of the process so much and provided a consistent record for us uh, for liability purposes. So as you might imagine, when you, anytime you're responsible for curve signage, highway signage, um, there's some liability that goes along with that, a substantial bit, actually. Um, in the event there would be any kind of a, um, you know, an accident or anything like that. This is great because we have a, a good, solid record and objective means of determining what these parameters were uh, for our design. So a summary really there of our horizontal curve analysis, digital ball bank indicator attached to GPS. We ended up with some automatic curve reporting out of that effort and had consistent data that was spatially located in GIS. So now we've got our curve information to add to the, the soup can uh, to prepare us for design. So we've talked a lot about data collection. We're not quite done yet. We haven't even started designing because we still have a little bit of information that would be useful to our design team. Those two pieces are slope and radii evaluation. So not only was existing condition and curve information necessary, slope and intersection radii evaluation is considered during design. And using the GIS paired with the road line data that was acquired by the mobile imaging system, we were actually able to calculate the slopes and the distances of those grades and 
display them visually, graphically in GIS so that our designers at a glance could know where they needed to start paying attention to those changes um, because there are design considerations that have to be made uh, when those changes happen. So this was a huge value add to just having that good GPS data on those road lines because then we had, um, you know, we already had the data we needed to kind of take that to the next level. Goes into that increase of value again when looking at these projects. Intersection radii analysis, uh, this is necessary for determining where certain delineation was required. So really there's a simple kind of an over under of a, of a radius uh, at intersections. If it's over a certain value, it's colored one. If it's under, it's colored another. And that just triggers our designers to know um, if and which type of delineation needs to be put in at, at that particular intersection. So that was a whole lot of preparing to actually get to work designing. And they designed and designed and designed. As you can imagine, this was a, a very labor intensive effort, but all of the front end work we did to carefully collect, organize, analyze, and, and manage our project data just absolutely paid dividends during the design process. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the end goal was a set of biddable construction plans. Um, so here we are. Um, any of you that work in the engineering arena know that quantity takeoffs are a big part of that, that um, piece in a design project. And let me tell you, designing or um, developing installation tables for approximately 40,000 items is a fairly daunting task. And one that really scared the heck out of me at the beginning of this project and is why we put on our thinking cap to say, how can we manage this beast? Because this, this is a massive undertaking here. Um, so the final design plans consisted of 638 pages. 520 of those were installation tables, just to give you some sense of what that looked like. So how did we get there? GIS was the, hip, the heavy lifter in this effort. Uh, careful database schema design at the beginning of the project, paired with GIS's just analytical and automation strengths yielded an extraordinary time savings and confidence with data integrity. So because we were very careful in how we designed our database, how we laid everything out at the beginning of the project, we were able at the very end to um, run these automated processes and feel very good about our quantity takeoffs because there was really very little um, human error that could enter into it. I guess, think about Excel spreadsheets and 40,000 um, install and removal items, just two on that. <laughs> Step five, we go to bidding. So mission accomplished. First part of the project complete. Final plans are submitted in May of 2020. Bids were opened and awarded in August of 2020 and construction began. And it's still ongoing. Uh, this is a, a huge project. It's, it's getting towards the end here and, and starting to wind down. Uh, our firm is, is also performing the construction administration and observation services for this project. So essentially that just means we're ensuring the signs are being installed for the design and the specification. So to help organize this stage of the project, we're using our GIS field map um, Again, so our construction observers who are out in the field and observing what's supposed to be being installed, what's being installed, tracking quantities, um, et cetera, they have, a, again, a centralized means of doing that, which is, has proven to be very, very beneficial for us. And the final step here is as-building. Uh, we're also under contract to provide as-built locations of the installed signage. And we're once again using mobile imaging and photogrammetric reduction uh, to survey these assets. Along the way, we have been playing with some um, AI solutions. We, we did a decent bit of R&D in this arena uh, through this project. We didn't feel quite ready to put it into production yet for the end of this project, but I think on the horizon that will be a very viable option as these signing projects continue on. Uh, the client will see a tremendous value add, and it comes back again to what Richard mentioned about increase of value to the solutions we provide. We collected this imagery um, to help us with the project and, and managing it and, and completing it efficiently, but it's also a value add for the client because they now have 360 degree roadway imagery and they can use that into the future to manage any kind of um, asset that they're responsible for. You might imagine 
guardrails and bridges and culverts and all of the things that come along with managing a, a countywide highway system. And they also have an asset inventory now of the, the constructed condition to move into the future, and they absolutely will use it for O&M activities. They've been progressive in the past in using GIS to help manage those sorts of activities, so it was a great fit that uh, we we provided the as-built deliverable for them and they can take off and continue using it into the future. So with that, I think I'm right up against time here. I would just like to summarize that I, I hope this has been a, a good example of how we've taken surveying and GIS and engineering and kind of wrapped it all together um, to produce a really a successful, a successful project here. So I don't know if we have time for questions here, but uh, we do. Yeah, we do, Linda. That was a that was a great presentation, and I think you do a really good job of showing how GIS is kind of a kind of an infrastructure for the project. It's not the, necessarily the design piece. It's not necessarily the surveying piece, but it's kind of the it's kind of the what do you call it the the soup the bowl of soup that the yeah, that I like to call it kind the soup of, can the soup can that everything goes into. I also like the fact that. Uh, that presentation was not done in PowerPoint. That's uh, was all done in a story map, and I, that that always shows that shows nice. Uh, any questions for uh, for Linda on this? The uh, a lot of claps. Um, GIS land surveying are inextricably linked. Ne linked. Neither more is more important than the other. And GIS is the umbrella. I think that's the, I think that's really true. It's kind of like how we. You know how we pull all these things together, and I think it, it just, you know, it it just does a good job of showing the different roles. You know, on the in the previous presentation of showing collecting all these different data sets and 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 then doing some analysis, and this is the same thing, but very different, uh, very different data sets, very different uh, uh, analysis. All right. Well, if there's no questions. Um, we're going to we're going to conclude today's session and, and thank Lynn and Richard uh, for their presentations. I'd like to thank you for your attendance, and we'll see you tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern Time, two p.m. Central. Uh, but for the young professionals, there's a networking session tomorrow at noon. So I don't really know what young professional is. It depends, I guess, on which profession. If you're if you're a surveyor, I suppose the young professional is a little bit older than me <laughs> in GIS, but. If you consider yourself young, and I think that's that's uh, that we'll go with that definition. If you consider yourself a young professional, please attend and uh, join in on the uh, on the networking. And with that, I'll call us to a close and, and thank all the presenters and all the attendees.